after this year is out. So that's important. Um, everybody's been asking at the various meetings, what is the meeting schedule? What's that all about? What, what are we going to be? Are we meeting every month? Are we meeting every five months, six months? So we selected a bi-monthly schedule. I think that's great, which means it doesn't take too much time out of everyone's uh, personal life or work life. But it allows us to be a very vibrant section. So we selected dates. The last Wednesday of every month will be our date for this sectional meeting. And as we know from previous meetings, we had one at Full Sail, we had one at Frontline, obviously we've had a couple here, and we'll continue that process. And I know that um, Frank, Frank, where are you? Frank, Frank, thank you. Frank has volunteered once he talks to his GM at his station, uh, the ability to go there at I want to call it clickorlando.com, but which it's not. But uh, <laughs> that's what I know it has on my iPhone. Uh, but we're going to go there and have a great, a great time as well. So here's the deal. If you want to keep it in mind, we'll post it on our website. We'll post it on our Facebook page. And we'll send it around as a general email June 24th, August 26th, October 21st, and December 17th. October 21st will be a cookout. And at that cookout, we want to have a drone demo from manufacturers. So we'll be outside. We can bring some drones in. We can harass each other, do all these nice things, chase each other down the street, whatever is involved. And so it's perfect from a cookout environment to be outside. December 17th, that's going to be our meeting. It'll be kind of a quasi-meeting and turn it into a holiday party. And a holiday party, obviously, will mean a little more than the Diet Coke. Diet Coke with lemon, Diet Coke with lime, Diet Coke with vanilla. What else do they have upstairs? That will Diet Coke, everything. So it'll be a good time. Uh, I want to ask this question, meeting format, one presenter versus two. We've had two presenters all the way through our meetings for this past year. We felt that the two presenters that were major in stature probably sent our meeting a little bit longer than what we had anticipated. Uh, the beauty tonight is even though Cisco is one company, there are two particular subject matters, but we talked about in the last meeting at Frontline, which is why I want to open it up to this group and get some immediate feedback, if we did one major, and I don't want to say minor, one major and one maybe lesser presenter at these meetings, still keeping it into the same timeline and keeping it interesting in relating the subjects, does that work for you? I, not just a shake of the head, it's like, yeah! Okay. All right. So you did give good. That's good. That's, that's what we need. If not, we'll book one presenter and then we'll have lower attendance because someone will say, oh, I really don't want to hear it like that, so I'm not going to go. So I think it's important to have the two. I appreciate your uh, your support on that. And then, oh, look at this. Unbelievable technology. So I mentioned October cookout with drones. A quick uh, NAB recap from my perspective, and I say very quick. NAB was exciting this year. Well, when I say exciting, this was the first time in a number of years, and I, you know, I've been there a number of years, um, where you actually walked the floor and there was a buzz. In the previous years, because of the economy, because of changes, changes in technology and development and all of that, it was like, eh, same old NAB. This year, different, and different for a couple of reasons, which I want to mention. One is IP workflows. No matter where you walk, there's an IP workflow. I mean, there's either IP servers, IP switchers, IP devices, IP routers. It's IP, IP, IP. We kind of tied into that when we had Hugo here from Sony, their chief technology officer that presented on IP workflows. We had Grass Valley Belden Group that came here and presented on some of their IP solution. And Cisco here tonight is to present more of their white paper side of what they feel the IP workflow is, which is wonderful. Archive systems, robust on the NAB floor. Everywhere you look, someone's got a spinning disk or a solid state drive or an optical drive or still someone's promoting uh, LTO. Yeah, I, I know, I know. Wireless Wi-Fi cameras. We had JVC come in last meeting, presented a Wi-Fi camera solution. I know some of you, and I talked about it there, uh, about LiveView as a competing factor. Well, there's a lot of competition out there today. Sony makes a Wi-Fi device. Um, Ikigami's making a Wi-Fi device. Everybody's making a Wi-Fi device. So many choices today. It's kind of interesting, which is going to tie a little bit into the security side of things. Very high frame, frame rate HD and 4K cameras. They're everywhere. I can name you six manufacturers. Don't want to bore you. 
that are all making high frame rate cameras today. So that's another big buzz out there. Why? People want to see the ball off the bat. They want to see the hockey puck hitting, obviously, the stick. They want to see the golf ball being compressed by a club. They want to see this action in deep detail. But why do they want it ultra high speed? Because the sponsor wants to see their logo on the device as it spins. So that's why they're getting up to a thousand plus frame rate, even in 4K. They want to see the Nike logo or Spalding or whatever it happens to be in baseball, basketball, golf, or otherwise. That was right. 4, 4K and beyond service. I, I say this because um, obviously those that are Gulf Channel related here know, know that we've been playing with 4K for some time and dealing with that technology in a great degree, in a high level degree. But now you've got not only 4K, I actually had one of our, uh, one of our editing producers come to me yesterday and say, you know, we're getting a lot of content in 5K. And I'm like, really? Getting content in 5K? Well, what about 6K? Except 12K. What about that? So this is it. This is it. You're in this industry. Latch yourself in. It's happening. And the big important thing, which I'd like feedback on, please send it to our website. Post it on Facebook page. Do something. I want to know the topics of interest that you have. Because we'll get those manufacturers to come in and talk about their solutions. This is important. Important for you. I don't want to determine everything you need to hear. I want you to tell me what you want to hear so we can bring this to life. Future meetings. We've talked a little bit about this. KVM systems and remote technology. We have a couple of manufacturers, vendors that want to bring in their KVM and other technology, with meaning connectivity technology into KVM systems. Something that a lot of companies do today because not everything is concentric with being 15 feet away in the next room. Doesn't happen, so that's important. I say Eberts, they're chopping at the bit to come in and present an IP solution for their router technology. I've seen mobile units. At NAB they had mobile units. Game Creek has a mobile unit launching. NEP has mobile units launching that are IP today. IP switchers, IP routers, IP workflows. So that's important. So they would like to present. We'll see. 4K pan and scan replay systems. The big buzz today is obviously recording in 4K and doing a cutout so that we can deliver it in 1080. Pretty simple. Move it around, move the joystick. I'm going to do a little cutout, pan, and scan. That's what I want. Click. It's a 1080 signal. Very interesting. And high-speed camera demo. So, point of information. The results are in. No, they're not. The results are in percentage-wise of what has happened. So I put this slide in here because this comes to the chairman, and I want you to know that here's a section that's only been out there for a few months. And the response from this group has been enormous. I mean, look at where we are. We're fourth on the list. Italy, Pittsburgh, Sacramento, and you. And the interesting thing is, some of our votes, we understand, might have went, and I don't mean for counted to the ballot, but percentage-wise, actually went to Atlanta. Or vice versa, really not sure. But that percentage might even be higher. But we're really excited. You guys beat New England, where obviously I came from, that pitfall, 16.31%. Those Yankees up there have nothing over us, and on and on and on. You know, we beat Hong Kong, and that's important too. Yeah, we, well, whoa, we beat Atlanta. Yes, I know. All right, all right, all right. Jack, if you're on the streaming here, I'm sorry. They clapped. I did. Okay, next bit. Our 2015 budget, as I mentioned earlier, was approved. That's why there's a smiley face. Next one, please. And I want Mike. Uh, Maybe, Mike, you want to take a second, if you can. I know you're handling some of the aspects, but if you want to just stand up and talk to the people about it runs by what we got. Thank you. So um, so we uh, we submitted a budget. This is our treasurer, by the way, for those of you that don't oh, know. Oh, yes, sorry. Mike Parney, I'm the secretary treasurer. I'm the guy that sent you all the emails. Um, so, so basically, we did something. Uh, there seems to be no formal way of submitting a budget. Uh, so we put together a document with questions. And we put together a, an Excel with various budgets and, and all kinds of things. And uh, we tried to be very conservative. As you may or may not know, for the last year, we've effectively been operating on our own without any kind of funding uh, through sponsorship, uh, through people like me that bring a lot of equipment to do what we need to do, um, and through generous uh, people like Ken that allow us to have these great facilities for nothing. 
Um, so we've done really, really well, not only in attendance, but in also in our ability to do a lot with not much. And, uh, but we are entitled to some monies, and that money comes from the National uh, CIMTI, uh Committee. And so we were very conservative in our amounts, and they were uh, granted to us. It will allow us to do a lot more. It will allow us to do this barbecue that we'd like to do in October. It will allow us to do... Beer. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so all kinds of things. So basically what I'm saying is not with a budget. If you like what you saw for the last year, it should get even better. So uh, thank you very much for showing up at these meetings and... Uh, we try to keep you entertained. Ken does a, a wonderful job as an MC. Two shows nightly. And, and, uh, and really, we can't thank you enough for being here. Uh, the whole idea behind starting SIMT was to get young and older people together and back in our industry. And I see a good variety of people here tonight. So we really appreciate that. We need more women like you, Renny. And uh, you know, we need more young people. So if you guys have suggestions, ideas, go on our Facebook, go on our web page. Send us emails. Let us know what you'd like to see. We're here for you. That's really the idea. But the good news is our budget was approved in five seconds in Las Vegas. Yeah, it was actually seven. But it was okay. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Right. Great job. You did a great job. For us. Right. So our very first topic this evening being presented, obviously, by the Cisco Group, which I'll let uh, Michael and company introduce themselves and stand and talk a little bit about briefly what their background is. But I want to mention something first. One of the uh, one of the driving points that I tried to make for a number of months here is we need to get security, IP based security talked about in here. Because as we're all moving our workflows over to IP technology and all using zeros and ones and back and forth and public internets and private systems that are connected to somebody's public system and whose VPN is secure and who's not, it's scary. I mean look what has happened and we talked about the most recently we talked about the Sony uh, impregnation within their um, within their unit and getting into their cloud-based services and letting the whole world know what people make and look at all the content you have and you want to watch a movie yeah I got it right here that was one problem and then all of a sudden you read oh my God the White House is penetrated not only the White House is penetrated the president's email it might not as might not be as most secure email but it's his communication and from that they get into everybody else's area. And I know that's not the video side, but it is part and parcel of what happens out there. So what's important for you to know? I'm talking about all of this, and I've been kind of sharing that. And two days ago, dos, yeah, thank you. We have, we have a Czechoslovakian group in the Eastern Bloc countries penetrate our, our Gulf Channel, NBC, Appella camera systems. What does that mean? So we use the public internet by using Time Warner, by using Cox, by using Comcast to send this quasi HD H.264 signal down a public internet line into a device and we put that on air. So we can interview talent for those that don't work at Gulf Channel. We can interview talent at their home. They don't have to get up in the morning to come here. It's a news breaking thing and we connect right into them, uh, whether it be Farahi, whether it be Feinstein, or wherever it happens to be, Gulf Digest in New York. And come to find out, we did a reping back to see where it's coming from. It's coming from the Eastern Bloc, old Soviet Union hacker-based operation. Well, they don't necessarily know that they're trying to penetrate a camera, but they're trying to find a weakness in a network. They're trying to get in to find a back door. So if this system, if we had it connected, to our internal service system connected into our tech core with the advent of using so much Windows based product and dot .exe wow it could be interesting you could take control of Gulf Channel on the air you could take it down you could route whatever you wanted you could do quite a number of mischievous or mischievous things to take us and hurt us luckily that signal dead ends at the camera it goes maybe into a frame sync but we don't connect it into our network other than the fact that we take an HD SDI signal out and put it in the switcher. But there's no data transmission. But they're just looking for a way in. At a place that is ultra secure, they are working every day. So we had to issue an edict out there to shut these cameras off in the field, four of them. 
and we'll only fire them up by calling the talent at home saying, okay, we're ready to go on now, turn your system on. Because these cameras are actually going on, lighting up, and being a nuisance over and over and over because obviously they use the robotic pings to try to find out where they can go. So what do they do today? They get into one system, to get into a subsystem, they get into someone else's system, and the next thing you know, if it's a financial problem, you're done. If it's an operational problem, you're done. So it just happened to work out. We didn't plan it that way. We didn't call anybody in the Czech Republic to do this, but it just happened to work out that uh, Cisco was on a, our schedule this evening. So that being said, I'd like to turn it over to the fine people, which is both the Michael and Stan and company, um, and then we're obviously going to go into IP-based production after this. So gentlemen, if you could please talk about yourself a little bit. Thank you. Okay, you can clap for me. <laughs> thank you. So, um, Kent, we wanted to thank you for the opportunity to come tonight and speak about both of these topics that are important to Cisco, uh, Cisco as we uh, all see the threats of, uh, and the hackers of today, and, and I know it's top of mind for everyone here. Um, also, IP production and what Cisco is doing with that transition. Um, so we talked about uh, Stan Shelton, who is service delivery executive, that's going to speak on security. Unfortunately, Mike had a fam family illness and won't be here tonight. And Peter Chay, the lead architect for uh, all IP production. So first, before we do that, we want to take a few minutes. I want to introduce to you Jim Pledier. Jim leads our media organization. And he wanted to just say a few words about our commitment to, to the media in your industry. So first I want to say thank you. Thank you for your time tonight. Thank you, thank you Jim. to Ken for having us. Um, we welcome the opportunity to come talk about what we're doing in media. Um, Cisco is very focused in the media space. We have a media focused vertical. We're focused on media solutions that are multi-vendor. We're looking at all IP. Peter will go through that in pretty good detail, but we're looking at how do you go all IP production. We're doing a lot of uh, work with our, for our equipment there. Um, how that works. There's a huge commitment from Cisco to uh, making sure we're really looking at the space, where it is today, where it's going, making sure we have solutions for each to go there. So we're constantly looking at who's, who, who are the who are the third party providers that we need to we need to put in, into our solutions. So if there's something you think that you need us to, to work with from a software product perspective or hey this is what we're thinking about. If you can give it to Ken, we're definitely uh, interested in knowing more about the folks who can do that. So I just want to take a couple minutes, so thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm uh, Stan Shilton, and I'm from Atlanta. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, I wanted to talk to you guys. I hate it because I'm so bright. I'm I just can't get used to the weather. <laughs> um, tonight I wanted to do a few things. One, I'm going to show you what we're looking at in security. I'm not going to deep dive on how to configure a firewall. Um, but I want to give you a perspective from Cisco's uh, point of view around security, why it's so important. Give you some statistics around what we see working with our industry partners, with others, uh, and, and how that's going to be relevant to you. Uh, as you move into an IP scheme, an IP delivery system, uh, we hope that you use Cisco, of course, but we, we actually have uh, invested millions and millions of dollars uh, over the past few years, not only in organic uh, growth and skills, but also external acquisitions to make sure that we bring the best and the brightest to the security uh, workforce around Cisco's uh, focus on security. So um, a couple things I want, to, uh, I want to cover today are around, let's go to the next one, please. What's driving security as a concern? A lot of changing business models out there. It used to be the enterprise was a nice <coughs> four wall kind of place that you didn't have to go outside of, right? Everything you, you are, uh, well, I'll say everything, but there's a lot of applications and a lot of things are extending your business model way out into the, to the edge. So there's lots of people, whether you whether it's real time access to your uh, data centers or, or through an app or, or other means, are actually, you're extending your enterprise. So the changing business models around how that enterprise is getting to consumers. A good example is uh, a lot of over-the-top offers that the market's come out with, a lot of the content providers, right? You gotta get to over-the-top to a consumer, you gotta get to a device. How's that device secured? 
How's that device interacting with your stream? You know, those are things that you got to consider, right? Security needs to be thought of in context of everything you're doing these days. I think the check Czechoslovakian example is a perfect one where if it's not automated, um, I, would, I would be, you know, uh, um, res res resident to say that if, if there's enough uh, folks looking at your network, or aren't enough folks looking at your network uh, from a manual perspective, they got some automated penetration means that they're using every day. A lot of businesses don't even understand when they're breached. We'll go through some of that detail, right? Um, personally, um, I dealt with uh, the Sony Pictures Entertainment uh, situation. I'll give you a little insight there. I'm under NDA with Sony. I'm not going to give you any information that would violate that trust. But I will share with you from the stuff that's got out in the press, kind of a perspective of what they went through. It's pretty traumatic. There's a very dynamic landscape that's emerging, whether it's uh, you know the Eastern Bloc political motivations, right? SDE wasn't uh, wasn't a breach. wasn't about you know so much stealing their stuff, right? It was about they were you know the folks that did it were a little hacked off that the U.S. make in light of another country, right? Political motivations. You certainly have financial motivations. I believe the number is around 750 million people have their information exposed to the world, black markets, whatever. 750 million. There's financial motivations for folks to get that information and sell it. it. Happens all the time. There's also folks that like to play. Now, your, your example of the Czechoslovakians, who knows? Probably somebody trying to figure out how to how to, uh, how to play and do things that uh, that benefit them. The market for security is very complex. There are hundreds of vendors. From a CISO perspective. She or he has got to be thinking about how to, you know, I can't deal with 100 plus vendors. And we have customers that have 100 plus security vendors. How do you manage that environment? You have changing business models. You have a very dynamic changing threat landscape. And you have a very fragmented security market. Everybody wants your business, right? Just as you guys are doing the transition to IP and video, you got all kinds of folks entering that market now, right? With all kinds of his name stuff. And, you know, 4K, 6K, 12K, whatever. They want to bring, they, you know, they're entering the market. So you've got lots of stuff going on. Thanks, Chuck. One more time. Well, let's, we talk about the changing business landscape. Uh, corporate owned. What do I mean by corporate owned? 90% of the organizations, and these, this isn't Cisco's day. You know, we get it from Gartner, IDC, other partners, InfoSec Online, those are the type of outlets. 90% of the corporate-owned, uh, or 90% of the corporations don't understand what devices are accessing their network. You guys have heard of BYOD, right? Bring your own device. I've got an iPad. I, you know, Cisco has, fortunately, a lot of security requirements if you want to bring, uh, bring your own device. A lot of corporations don't. You know, I use a username and password. How's that device managed? How's security handled? So a lot of the transition from a traditional enterprise-owned environment where the enterprise supplied you with a computer, you use that computer for work, you went through a VPN, that's the only way you access work if you remote, that's all changed. So moving from, moving from uh, corporations paying for the devices to you, you know, you, you know using whatever you, know, you want to use, that's also a security threat, presents a security threat. 14% of the organizations, from, a, from a, an email perspective, have been infected with malware through their email just because they didn't have the right security capabilities. From a data center perspective, this is an interesting one. Cisco did an internal study not too long ago. We actually went in and understood how many people, cloud, right, that, that nice term cloud, um, how many people had personal clouds, how many people were using clouds inside the enterprise. It was hundreds of times more that we thought was happening in our own environment for cloud usage. This is from uh, InfoSec, a statistic. 92% of the apps of the top 500 Android apps have security requirements. 92%. So the next time you download that little app and you ignore the privacy, you think about that. They're telling you somewhere <laughs> 
in that long list of privacy stuff that they're going to use your data or they're doing something or whatever. It's a privacy risk, right? So you, you are opening up yourself in those environments. Next step, next chart. The impact of a breach, and I want to talk about, you know, some generalities of the impact, but I want to get into some specifics <coughs> as well. A breach, usually 60% of the, of the data, data is stolen within hours of the breach, within hours. Never knew it was there. Never knew they got the, the data, right? 60%. That's a pretty interesting statistic around 54% of the breaches aren't even undis are undiscovered for months. They didn't even know someone came in and stole data. Now those folks are looking for a financial incentive, right? Usually. You saw the statistic around, I mentioned it earlier, 750 million individuals on the black, your information's on the black. I'm sure mine's out there. What's that spawning? You guys have heard of life lock, right? Well, you know, I watch the late night golf channel too. Life lock is there every time. They, they're trying to they're trying to tell me they're gonna monitor me on the internet. And I'm gonna you know tell me when I get you know a violation. You know, I'm sitting there it's great. So the whole industry is being spawned around security, not only selling the stuff, but how to manage it and prevent it. It's interesting how security has become such a driving force in our society. Let's talk about some real business impacts. I'm not going to tell you anything that's not in the press <laughs> around Sony. Sony Pictures Entertainment, not Sony the corporation. Sony Pictures Entertainment underwent a breach. Um, my first contact with them was Thanksgiving of last year. You saw some of the articles, you know, the, the desktops were hacked, right? They had pictures, they had, they did a, they did a fairly significant breach. This quote from their uh, CTO, 35 million, estimated $35 million impact to restore their IT and financial systems after that breach. That's the hits hitting their earnings. There's no revenue to go with that. That hits their margin, baby. Boom. And they're going to take that just for year 14 ahead. Think about what they had to go through. Think about their IT system. What does that mean? You know their computers are breached. Are they going to reuse those, those computers that were breached? Probably spend a lot of money buying new computers, right? How much data from employees are stored in the cloud? Terabits, the terabytes of information are stored in the cloud around personal email, files, you name it. People had to go through that stuff and, and uh, filter it to make sure there wasn't anything latent there. They had no idea, like, what did these apps do? From a Vendor perspective, I'm sure they have to go and recertify every vendor's piece of gear in their entire infrastructure. That's just the IT stuff. What about their financial systems, right? Can't cut POs, can't cut paychecks, on and on. Right? So the big, big impact to Sony. And they've come out publicly and taken a hit for $35 million to just deal with that breach. Target, that's, you know, fairly common. You guys have seen that. I wasn't impacted, although I did use a credit card at Target, so I worry. Um, <clears throat> their CEO lost, uh, lost his job on two. Uh, well, it wasn't just because of this. There were other issues. Retail sector, uh, the, top, the, tw the top 20 hits in 2014, the top 20 breaches in 2014, the retail sector, was 50% of us. Ten breaches in the retail sector, major ones, in 2014. If you look at how much these companies are spending on uh, security per employee, in the retail sector, it's about 400 bucks per employee that they spend on on uh, security on IT. I should say, not security on IT. Financial institutions, there were some breaches. They were very, very few. They spend about $2,400 per employee. So you see there's a direct correlation to how easy it is to get into a business versus how much you spend in IT to secure your environment, so to manage your environment, right? So what does it tell you? Retail is an easy target. They don't spend a lot of money in IT. They don't put a lot of focus on uh, securing that environment as well. They're an easy target. And retail has your 
information. We do credit cards, right? Yeah, mine too. <laughs> you mentioned this, Ken, earlier. Uh, Russian hackers read Obama's uh, unclassified emails. They didn't do that beginning of money. They did that to figure out what we're doing. And we only know that they did that. We're not sure how deep that penetration went. We just want I read an interesting article yesterday. It, you guys, it, it, the, the General Accounting Office of the government, which, interestingly enough, have we talked about the NSA recently? It's all shifted in media to our personal security, right? We haven't talked about the government spying on us. We've talked about how people are getting access and, and uh, invading our rights, right? The GAO came out with a warning, uns unsubstantiated, about potential hacks of airplanes. Are you kidding me? So people have latched onto that in the media. Uh, this week, I think it was, I think it was the 21st, um, maybe last week, there was a gentleman on a flight from Chicago, a United States flight from Chicago to Syracuse. He tweeted on the plane that he was trying to hack the plane. And going to, it's going to play with the oxygen masks. This, you know, these are the stupid ones, right? So, <laughs> so who was waiting him, waiting for him in Syracuse? The FBI. They hold him right off the plane, confiscate everything. I have no idea. That, I, you know, I haven't heard anything else about the guy. We probably won't for a while, right? <laughs> so there's the folks who are politically motivated. There's the folks who sell your information, financial gain politically motivated, and then there's just the plain guys who think it's, over, think it's fun, all right? Next one. This has become an industry, folks. My daughter is at Georgia Tech right now, and she's participating in a hackathon this weekend. And now, listen to this. Listen to this. The hackathon is being sponsored by Georgia Tech. All the proceeds for the hackathon are going to a local charity. So we figured out a way to support charities of the security risk, right? This is not a problem. You know, those hackathons happen all the time. You guys can read about that stuff, right? Um, one of the interesting things is uh, that uh, the Air Force has recently come out with a, a degree, a major, in cyber security, cyber and security and computer security. We're now putting a focus on it, a serious one around training and uh, enabling people to understand how to secure environments at the academic level. This, this is probably one of the only job markets that outstrips the supply by hundreds of percent, right? I mean, it's, just, it's unreal. The development of the workforce around security. So if you're looking for a second career, you can see this rose with the internet. Uh, threats are becoming much, much more sophisticated. The really evil people just want to get your stuff and they'll never, never let you know it. Keep that back door open and come in from time to time to see if you got any more good stuff that you take, right? The common criminals, they just want to make money, quick buck, etc. Next one. I want to just a, a bit about the fragmented market. RSA 2015, which is the security conference out in San Francisco, was just held. Um, in 2014, there were 100 security, uh, excuse me, 373 vendors there. I think it's approached 500 this year. I just don't have the current count. It's tremendous how many people are in this market. It's confusing to an enterprise. Who's going to deal with it? Right? How do I, I need a security strategy. I need somebody who understands my environment, not selling platforms. How do we deal with um, the security from our perspective? We think that there's three main things you need to worry about. Number one, you got to know what's on the network. We do a custom threat set assessment. We do CTI, and this isn't a sales pitch at all. I'm saying at Cisco, we're in this in a big way. We're doing a custom threat intrusion uh, capability now with a number of customers. When we come in for 90 days with the sensors across the network, we understand just how porous your environment is, right? And we'll tell you. A, a nice report. Here's what your environment looks like. Here's how many breaches are occurring, both in, coming in and going out. How much data? So, anomalies in the environment. How porous is your environment? You got to have visibility. 
You have to be threat focused. We have a peace service, we call it peace service, let's go. It's a proactive security incident response team. Our advanced services team, which, uh, which I work with closely, this peace service team looks at, this is all they do, threat assessment, threat intelligence. We provide that data to our customers on an ongoing basis. And we actually have capabilities to look at a customer's network and tell them this security threat is present on these five devices. And here's what you do to remediate it. Those are things that we do for our, for our customers from a security analysis and threat uh, perspective. It's not, it's, not a, it's not a Cisco solution we're trying to, to work on here. It's an open platform, open environment, scalable, highly efficient security capability that our customers need. And that's not just Cisco stuff, it's other vendors as well. We also do managed threat defense, we, uh, we have managed certain security knocks, we do all this stuff on an ongoing basis for a number of customers, right? You need to be thinking about this stuff as you go out to base. I would be remiss if I didn't, and this is not a sales pitch, I would be remiss <laughs> in saying, look, Cisco, we understand this environment. We're not, I won't say necessarily known in the industry as a security force. Uh, but the investments we've made and the people and skills that we've acquired, we have a, a lot of terrific capabilities that we're bringing to our customers today. The, the, the response team, red team we call them, from within 24 hours after a major breach, we have people on the ground in data centers <coughs> understanding what they need to do, helping, helping, helping them understand what to do with their environment, uh, and basically consulting them through the situation and getting them to cover. Okay. I want to end with this. If you think today's fun, <laughs> the Internet of Everything, how many of you heard that? You have heard the Internet of Everything. Holy crap. I just read the Apple Watch, the IT, IT configuration kit that, came, that comes with, the, uh, uh, with the, the Apple Watch. It has a capability in it to determine if skin detection is present on that watch. And they're doing that for another layer of security. It doesn't mean it's your skin, so it's like you steal your watch, but you know, it's another layer of security to penetrate or get into an environment, right? It's so the vendors on the internet of everything have got to understand and deliver security capabilities in those devices as well. And companies like yours need to take advantage of those. Those nice new cameras, I'll be asking them questions. What's the security strategy for this camera? What's the security interface? What, what do you have that will tell me that uh, that this camera has been, uh, you know, accessed by someone outside of my ACL or someone outside of my uh, security perimeter? Right? Things like that. You need to be pushing on the on the uh, vendors as well to, to you know, elaborate what the security strategy is for an interface. So, at the end of all this, I just want to say thank you very much. I wanted to give you. Here's the bigger picture, right? This is an industry now. It's not a playtime thing. People are stealing real money. People are threatening governments. When we do something that another government doesn't like, we saw what happened to some. That's a real business impact. You guys gotta be thinking about that. If you like to go to the next level around security detail in the future session, architecture is what our, you know, we can bring in the, the smart guy. I got actually there's a bunch of smart guys in the back room that can answer and configure anything you have, I'm sure, but I appreciate the time you guys have given me this afternoon, and uh, I'm going to go back to my other ones. <laughs> <laughs> any, uh, any questions to Stan? Any questions to Stan at all? JJ, I think you had a question about encryption. Is that, you weren't, weren't you saying that to me a little earlier? No? You, you, you don't want to get video from the uh, endpoint. Back into your infrastructure. <laughs> no, passing it over to the water. Uh, is, uh, is the hackathon sponsored by Cisco? <laughs> <laughs> we actually do. Yeah. We actually do sponsor. It, it would seem to be a smart move to get a bunch of smart people to go to Texas. Yeah. Break into things and then hire <laughs> 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 well, them. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, exactly. The, the challenge with it, you know, what, what got me about the Georgia Tech thing, and I'm an alumni of Georgia Tech, was the fact that they turned Georgia Tech to turn it into a sponsorship for local charities, all the proceeds, right? There's major fees, all kinds of stuff, but they turn all that money into a local charity. 
And I, that's pretty innovative thinking, right? But I'm like, wow, we can, we can figure out how to turn security risks or, or promote security hacks and give maturity. That's good. that's a good and bad side there, right? I'm going. Robin Hood. Robin Hood. There you yeah. go. Does your company participate in the Comcast hackathon? Uh, yeah, I'm sure we do. Sure, we do. I have. Um, yes, we do. Yes, we yes. Do. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we have several folks that support a number of uh, large cable subscribers. Here. Can you get into my ex-girlfriends? <laughs> <laughs> I'll talk to you later. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Peter, thank you very much. Um, my name is Peter Che. Um, I'm going to feel bad now having to stand and scared everybody about IP security risks, and I'm going to tell you, you need to put everything on IP. Uh, that's quite a good intro. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is what we call professional media networks. And this is really looking at uh, the whole business of production, um, looking at all the different processes. And really, you know, where, what's the, where are we in the transformation from where we were? We good? <laughs> uh, where are we in the transformation um, you know, journey from these dedicated appliances with dedicated infrastructures to a more kind of universal kind of data center type platform, everything running across a common uh, infrastructure. Um, so brief history on me, my background, I started 17 years ago in, in you know, uh, media and uh, uh, this kind of technology field. I started building MPEG-2 encoders. My first job was building an MPEG-2 decoder to match up with our MPEG-2 encoder made by another development team. And day one, my job was to make the two work together. And they did. This is, but this was brand new. MPEG-2 encoders were still about this big and they had like, <laughs> massive kind of heat sinks on them to keep them cool to do just one SD channel. Um, after that I moved into RF, I uh, got into, uh, I was part of the BBC project for doing the EBBT, so I started going back from all of this like cool new digital stuff I've been working on back to my wavy line and signal theory and remembering about Shannon and Wayne Chris and all these people that I remember college vaguely, which I wasn't paying attention to. Um, so I got out terrestrial and went into um, service work, so I was, actually did, the reason I actually ended up in the US, uh, I'm actually also from Atlanta, although the accent wasn't away. <laughs> the reason why I ended up in Lancers, I worked for a company, well, I was working for Barco at the time then, and I worked for Scientific Lancers required Barco. So, working for Scientific Lancers, I ended up working at the headquarters, because um, we were building uh, VOD um, uh, gateways. Uh, so, these are narrow class quad modulators. So, trying to pack as many RF channels into the smallest possible density. Uh, but the front end of this was all digital processing. I had to, you know, manipulate all these epic transport streams, put them together, and rebundle them to put them out. Um, the, reason I bring the, the reason I tell this story is because I see a real simile of what happened to ASI in 2000 as we went into the VOD system to what I see with SDI happening now. I'm not saying I'm trying to kill SDI, I just want it to go away. What happened to ASI, <laughs> <laughs> ASI went away very quickly in, in terms of what The reason was, when we were building these VOD gateways, the very first ones we built, the way we wired them up to the server, we took the VOD pub, which is basically a big PC, with some special software, and like the linear systems card, or an Azure card, or whatever the manufacturer at the time was, that was basically had six ASI speeds coming out the back, giving about a gig of delivery. This came across this huge bundle of coax, you know, which is probably only 100 meters, 300 feet from the server, unless you had some horrible optical electrical converters, which are a lot of those, would end up at these narrow class farms. This was horrible infrastructure, you know, and the very first VOD gateway I built had six ASI speeds on the card, and you had to wire it up, and that was like 119 ways you could plug them in the wrong way around. And I spent a lot of time in Chicago with Comcast debugging and troubleshooting these systems, and it was just a nightmare. But what happened was in 99 was Gigabit Ethernet really hit commodity pricing. It became available on every switch in the market. You could buy these things off the shelf. Now you can go buy them at Best Buy. Yeah. But back then it really hit that cost curve where suddenly, oh, I can use this, I can use this other medium to move the packets off a server to this narrow class gateway. And suddenly those six cables just seem archaic and seem like so complicated and so inflexible. It's like, Boom, literally within six months, we got rid of all of those ASI VOD pumps. They were gone. All of those ASI QAM gateways, there's a few that we can find them on eBay still. I do find them occasionally. But they went as well. And then over the next three or four years, all of the other things in the cable head end, people start going, well, you know, why are we using ASI for this and DAIGI for that and SWIFT and SPI and all these other you know, proprietary single use transports? We started just putting in IP switches in the core and tying everything to it. Now, you know, since like 2006 was the last last time we did any kind of heavy ASI in the system, and then everything was just big IP cores. The same thing is happening now with SDR, and that's really what the point of this presentation is. So, I've done this slide several different ways. Um, this one I thought I'd do a bit more media-centric rather than talking about what happened in enterprise service class, what happened in telephony and IP, so I'm going to get right back to tape production. 
Everyone remembers tapes. <laughs> tapes <were great. laughs> it took us about 15 years to get from tapes to files. We didn't really change the workflow. We just replaced a file with a tape. We did all the same things. We just, we, you know, we kind of remember this digital was it um, analog composite. A digital composite. We took we took an analog waveform. We digitized it. Oh god. So we had a few. Um, as we went into this process, we tried to keep a lot of our uh, Thomas Edward uses the word steel morphs. These are you know, replicas of uh, legacy processes we bring forward into the new world. Once we got off, once we got everything digital, we then really the, the, the whole business changed. It transformed from being okay, we've just managed to replicate one workflow in a new system. Now we have nonlinear editing. It's totally you know, We have all these new tools. The operators have adapted to this new kind of tool paradigm. We have a lot more ways of working with material. Media asset management systems are way more sophisticated than they ever were. These give us some really, you know, totally new tools and creative. It gives us a whole new way of handling and working, working remotely, working. You know, I don't have to be tied to a dedicated system and sat under my machine and kind of you know, liquid cooled supercomputer there. I can have just a very thin work life connected back to a data center. But that, like I said, we went through this transition of replicating the existing world. And then we were able to accelerate once we had this new set of tools. Same thing's happening right now in the SDI realm. Really, if you look at a facility, and this is a fantastic place you have it, you know, if you look at it from one lens, you go, well, we're a big SDI shop, there's big core routers, and everything comes down to these big, you know, big rectangular blocks down in the basement, and everything fans out from there. If you look at it from another end, it's like, wow, there's a lot of IP, everything runs on an IP network, and this is kind of weird island, that, like where there's like, high speed live stuff happens in the middle. So it's really, you know, the way the, the business is shifting is, it's now to the point where it's really just the last holdout. You know, this kind of tsunami of this generic technology that has this kind of really attractive cost serve that matches up with all these other industries where everyone's taking advantage of the common platform. It's really that we're at that tipping point, and that's what you'll see if you're at NAB. I mentioned this in the seminar. It was it was uh, mind blowing this year, and I'll actually do a little retrospective in a minute where I'll go back over the last two years from when it was like there were a few crazy people, including me, talking about this. To where it was this year, where it's like everyone's looking at IP. Like people are building stuff. People are doing stuff. Now. This is actually happening. So, the vision is we move to an environment where we have a common platform where all of these processes, be them live, be them post, um, be it distribution, all run off a common infrastructure, and everything is really just software running on this common core, as opposed to these dedicated app appliances and dedicated interfaces. So, where are we in this transition? We are still in this kind of non-IP traditional infrastructure mode. We are starting to do some what I call legacy over IP. This is going back to the, you know, the tape to file, or file to non-linear editing type um, transition. We're really in this mode of a lot of the systems are, you know, by virtue of the fact that we have a lot of stuff, SDI is ubiquitous, it just works. It's, you know, we've had it for 20 years. Um, it's, um, it's everywhere. But what we're trying to do right now is with a lot, a lot of the companies you see out there, a lot of um, builds being done right now. We're really just trying to take that existing infrastructure and then kind of map it onto this you know, IP technology. So how can we just like take SDI rapid and stick it over an IP network? Because we want to make it actually we want to make it cheaper around to it. We want to extend the signal further across the network. We haven't really got to this kind of end state where, just like we got to nonlinear editing, where we get to this point where we start to take advantages. We can actually do new, more powerful things. We can do some very um, the, the, the processes that we we'll create, we, haven't, we can't imagine yet, because we really haven't got to that point. A lot of people are experimenting with something. I know you're using the live stream right here. This is a... We have live <laughs> stream, we have social media, <laughs> <That's> a, <laughs> more <laughs> GLTs. We need to get you hooked up with a web system, I think. So. <laughs> <laughs> so a sales opportunity for something like that. So. <laughs> So, like I said, we're in, at least from the, I mean, if you look at the rest of the business, if you look at what we do on contribution, contribution now comes predominantly over IP, where it used to be dedicated Sonnet, it used to be dedicated dark fiber, TV1 circuits, and a lot of time going around stadiums trying to find that one connector that gets to the right place. Um, all of that's gone to IP. All of the nonlinear editing stuff's gone to IP. All of these systems that will work off a dedicated, you know, generic data center type architecture. Where we are with live production, because it's hard, you know, it's, it's very high, high speed, it's got very, very tight timing requirements. We're in this, in this phase of being between the traditional uh, dedicated infrastructure and back into a legacy over IP type model. We really are, there are some very kind of bleeding edge designs. If anyone's seen the BBC IP Studio project, that's an example of an IP centric architecture where they really changed the model, which is not thinking about the world as how can I make SDI flow over an IP, you know, uh, Cisco Nexus switch or across a UCS server. How can I change 
production to use the technology and to use the internet and to use the, the, the whole realm of um, functionalities out there, not just trying to map my existing workflow onto a new system. So it's kind of a two ways of thinking about the problem. And I'll, I'll give some examples in a second. So, dedicated appliances, moving to software and generic compute. This has happened in a lot of other industries. This is not, you know, uh, is it just inevitable? No, it's not inevitable, but it's, there's definitely good reasons why we want to do this. Um, discrete infrastructure, so dedicated cabling, dedicated wiring to a, a, stand, a flexible, a flexible um, shared medium. Uh, one of the great examples I've seen is these kind of backup camera packs that they're being made. Uh, Stage box by LT Tech is a great example of one, which is this box that basically takes those eight different cables that go into a backup camera. You've got linear time code, you've got gen lock, you've got the, uh, AFB, you know, the audio feedback to the operator, you've got video feedback, video off the camera, maybe lots of, you know, um, uh, maybe tally control or uh, the CCU control, all of these different cables that spider out across the studio and all these dedicated cables. Wrapping that all up onto a single IP interface and then running that straight back to a network that then splits that and hands it out to the right equipment. Well, that's great for the studio. That would be really nice to get rid of all those cables. Now I can run two cables for redundancy and I'm not banging the, you know, my <coughs> cable breaks and I'm not getting time code from that particular camera. I have to go and run another special cable line across the floor. So there's a reason why we want to do that for simplicity of operations. But also because what we're really about is saving money. You know, why all these other industries have changed and gone to this kind of data center, these cloud models, is the economics. Well, if I can buy a, if I can buy a system that can do the same processing that I need, and I can use the same box that say, you know, uh, industrial internet uses, the financial, the financial traders use this box. This is the same box that commercial, the enterprises. That means that I'm writing that same economy of scale. And that's really why, going back to my analogy about ASI, why ASI fell over so quickly is because it could only handle what? Yeah, 230 meg at the limit, nobody ever ran it that fast, it's about 150 for really high-end systems, or like 40 or 50 is typically what people were running. Give it Ethernet, out of the gate, it was already 6x the maximum of the line you do. And for those from applications, you're easily carrying 30 or 40 of the discrete transports you carry before. Technically, give it Ethernet hit quality three or four years ago. Um, at the point where it's actually the, the cost curve versus the uh, SDI interfaces. 40 gigabit is available today. 100 gigabit is available on the, kind of the higher end, more expensive routers. 400 gigabit Ethernet is in IEEE right now. That's what they're working on. Terabit Ethernet is being talked about and you know, quietly whispered about. Um, there's some challenges once you get to terabit Ethernet, but there's a plan to get there. Right, so the, the, you know, our, our special world at 1.5 gigs is really hard. It's high speeds, a lot of video, right? Those speeds suddenly don't mean anything. You know. <laughs> the latency is really important. But 100 gigabits per second, your latency on the wire, it's down in the nanoseconds. You know. And nanoseconds is when we're in analog sync world. That's when nanoseconds happen. We can get out of picoseconds if we need to. <laughs> now, this place at CERN are really picky about picoseconds. <laughs> we're not that way. We're good at, we're good at microseconds, really. So. <laughs> the speed takes care of itself, and you kind of you just get overtaken by that at some point. And you talk about you know, 4K, you talk about high frame rate, you talk about high dynamic range, all of these things coming at us. These are all challenges which we don't know which one's going to be the one that we need, which one's going to be the one that's going to take over. But I guarantee you, if, if, you, can, if you can wrap it up and put it on the internet, I can move it across the network. It doesn't matter how many frames per second is coming at you, or how, how, many, how many pixels wide it is. So, what do people keep asking me? They say, well, Cisco, what, what, what's, what's your answer? What's your solution? Give us, give us, give us an opinion here. What, yeah, you, you, you build big IT systems, you build these data centers, you've got this great compute platform, this great switching, you know, switching and ranking platforms. What's the recommendation? What, what should we buy? What should we use? So that's what we, we created this group within Cisco. It's a cross-functional discipline group. So I represent like the media group. So I came from you know, coders and multiplexers and RF modulators. So I understand you know, video and how to get it through uh, kind of networks. But part of the, the group crosses across our, our, our switch and rag groups, across our compute groups, across our security, across our time synchronization, yeah, and all of the different disciplines that you need to bring together to build literally, yeah, a really a really good infrastructure that can take these applications and deliver them you know, securely and reliably. So it's not just us. We spend a lot of time working with SMT. Um, uh, we have lots of people who are kind of on working groups, working with uh, particularly with things like Precision Time Protocol, with some of the efforts around the Joint Task Force activity, which is a, a joint SMT, EBU, and VSF group. Uh, I just have to, uh, work in the uh, SBIT, which is Studio Video over IP by uh, VSF, which is, again, looking at the same problem about how do we move 
um, to package up his networks for all the production. We also focus on IEEE, IETF, IES, all these different groups. So it's not about us trying to be prescriptive, it's about us trying to bring our experience, how we've done these transitions with our industries, to, to the table and say, hey, you know, here's your, tell us what the problems are, and we've actually solved these problems for other industries, and so maybe you don't realize that there's a solution out there already. That's the great thing about working with uh, um, uh, the VSF group, is we find solutions to problems that we just didn't you know, oh, we really need to solve this problem about how we do services company. This is very critical, SDP and there's MDNS, and there's always, oh, right, well, does that do what we need? Oh, yeah, that's, <laughs> we really that for voice. That was easy, you know. So it's, it's, it's bringing these different worlds together and trying to piece that together in a very collaborative way. So, what do you need? Well, to start with, we don't want to change the workflow for the operator. If you're a creative, you're sat in the gallery, you want to press the button, you want to get the feed up on the screen. Oh, and, you know, it's got to work the same way it did before. I can't be like, well, now I have to change the way that it works. It has to be seamless behind the scenes. So that's what all the demos you've seen are about, trying to replicate that experience or trying to make it so that when you sat at the control console or you've got a server running a run bank, you really don't see any difference. You know, the fact that there's not a great big rectangular round, round uh, monster behind the scenes, you don't know that. There's a has to be low latency with deterministic jitter. We have to, you know, it has to go to an SDI works very well with this. Uh, the IP network should give us the same facility. Zero packet loss. We don't want packets to get lost. We get very finicky about that. Audio is also very finicky. You don't you can't lose packets. It's not like we'll be like, well, my, my, my web page didn't matter, so I just hit relay. No, no, no. You know? When we're talking about IP, we're not talking about the internet, we're talking about just as a transport and as a technology. So, um, talk about microseconds. We can achieve microseconds. Microseconds are very easy to do. High frequency traders, for instance, they care about nanoseconds, because the nanosecond that they get over the guy next to them is a billion dollars they're making the work. So, you know, we've, we've solved some of these challenges. We know how to get down to those kind of timings. Fast switching, um, so we want to be able to move the signal around without just having to build, overbuild massive bandwidth just to solve it. And it has to have the same or better availability than existing systems, otherwise, you yeah, know, it's just not going to fly. And now that, now that I'm really worried about my personal information, thanks Dan, <laughs> um, it has to be secure. I mean, we can't just give you a system that now has a lot more, there's a lot more porous and a lot more hubs. So, um, if we look at where we are today, yeah, editing, non-linear editing, contribution, file transfer, these are all core things that we've done, these are systems we've built. They may be discrete islands today, they may be separate systems, and they may still be that way for several years to come. It's not, I'm not saying you need to collapse all this in one architecture, you need to run this on the same reactor with the same data center. I'm just saying we can. I'm saying that's the ultimate goal, is that you'll be able to share and reuse this resource. Whether you do it today, where you're on that continuum of how much I want to put together. Um, really, I mean, like remote production takes up advantage of a lot of IP stuff today, but it's not, it's kind of, you know, we use IP for the connectivity, but on the end it's still SDI, and it's still kind of, it just hops on and off the networks. It doesn't really, it's not tied up all the way through. We see a world of when these requirements are all overlapping, basically, and that you could build a common core to run all of your applications together across a common infrastructure. Whether you silo that up because of business unit, because of financial reporting lines, or how the way your business is organized, that's up to you. I'm just saying that you have one set of spares, at least. <laughs> so, the, the, these things all come together with a common set, of, uh, common set of goals and features that these products need, and that this infrastructure should give you. So, I mean, really our aim is to provide the best infrastructure. You know, we're not going to sell you an editing system, we're not going to sell you a, a production switcher. You know, you had Grass Valley come in and talk about, I'm going to talk about Grass Valley in a second. Um, so now, um, we, we don't make those kind of you know, applications, we build, we build infrastructure. And that's what we want to make sure as we get right, is we make the infrastructure uh, basically have all of the features and have all of the, the capabilities that's going to mean that these applications, A, will run very well, and B, that we can certify the infrastructure so you're not worried about the infrastructure. So when you have a problem, you're calling the app vendor, you're saying, hey, there's something wrong with this particular switch. And you say, well, we tested it with Cisco, we know it works. If you're running on this particular hardware profile, this particular BIOS, and da 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 we want to take care of that so that you can just concentrate on the application and on the creative and actually delivering the product, which is really what you want to do. So, it's not just Cisco. <laughs> um, we recognize that and that's what we've spent a lot of time over the last two years or so, particularly as we focused in on this area of the um, business working with, and these are the four main ones we're working with, we're working with about 20 ISVs all over, yeah, covering all, all range of different applications and different processes and things. But between Sony, Imagine, Grass Valley and Snell, they're the four big ones that really embrace the architecture we've um, discussed with the industry, and these are the ones we put demos together and we really kind of carry the, carry the narrative forward. Yeah. So, IP production. Two years ago, if you went around NAB, there were about three booths you would have seen something that said vaguely IP production. One of them, and this is my body, my stunt level, um, <laughs> was our booth. 
This is a demo I put together with Thomas Edwards from Fox. And what, what he came to me and said is, you know, we, we, we've been doing contribution, we've built the system for them to carry signals between their different facilities and have it all switch through a, a, an IP network. He said, could you make it, could you build a system where we could do this kind of very low latency and basically just switch everything in IP? So I put together this very simple, this is actually running on an iPad in this corner here. This is just like a very old school XY router. And we had, you know, different cameras, different effects units that we could punch in. But the core of the network was um, an off-the-shelf next to data center. This is what we, this is what we built. We basically had um, a server attached to this where we could actually take content off do some integration, put it back on, do recording and graphics. But again, this was two years ago. So this was this was crazy talk two years ago. You know, if you look around NAB this year, which I'll show you in a second, this is ubiquitous. But two years ago, this was crazy talk. Um, that you could get rid of SDI. You know, SDI could go away. Synergy actually had a Synergy was the other it was, um, Axon was the third. Synergy had a poster that said SDI must die. I actually have that in my hand. <laughs> 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 so, yeah, anyone got that poster? Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> But we were really trying to explore, could you do this? I mean, because we had the technology. We proved that, you could move, that IP was reliable. We moved um, the, 20, uh, the, the 2010 Super Bowl from, uh, from Dolphin Studio in Miami up, like, up to CBS in New York over uh, the same product that is here, the UCM Gateway, um, uncompressed at 1.5 gig. Now, we did that as a proof of concept. There was no, you know, this was just, hey, we've just got the new product bag. It's running like level one of the code. We put one in either end with level three with the partner there. And we just said, hey, we'll just set it up and let it run for the game so you can see what it looks like. That went, we found out two weeks later, that went to air for the whole game. Because the two other circuits, which were, you know, uh, one was, uh, um, they were just high bit rate mezzanine compression. They said, oh, this one, that feed was much cleaner. Well, yeah, we'll prove it was completely undepressed. Um, but we proved that we could, you know, we did the whole of the Commonwealth game, games over IP network, all of the contribution all the, between all the games. Now. We proved IP networks could do it, but we hadn't moved IP into the core yet. It's still used as just connection technology, a way of making those wires really long, essentially making the VNCs really long. So this was, again, this is two years ago. Um, in, the, in the fall of that year at 70 ATC, one of the big challenges, why, why would we, you know, one of the reasons why would we up here, what about 4K ultra high definition, 5K, 6K, 7K, 10K, I don't know. How do we move that across the network? Um, you know, there's 70, 2082, which is a, um, there's a fiber version, and there's, a cap, there's actually a 12 gig coax. Anyone plan on buying 12 gig coax for a 12 gig switcher? No. Well, Steve Landon stands up and waves a bit of coax at people and says, who wants to buy this? And everybody says, yes. <laughs> I think everyone put fiber in, you know, because if you put fiber in, at least you can just switch out when you put on it. But are we going to really go to, uh, you know, 42, 10 bit, 4K, P60? Oh, I want to get 128, not 119.88. Yeah, sure it's going to happen, but um, I want to go faster. So the demo we did here is the first time we've done this. We took uh, 4K P60 for video clarity, and there was only like three in the universe at this moment, over an existing gateway box. We aggregated it up onto a single 40 gigabit um, Ethernet. So this is actually 40 gigabit Ethernet copper. It's kind of, you can't really see it in there. But that's what, it was just a single single 40 gig copper cable between the two chassis. And so but we proved that you could take 4K, move it across a, yeah, an IP network, and take it off the other end. A horrible thing about 4K right now is you do this quad split cable thing, right? So you get four, you get the upper left, upper right, and you know, guess what happens? If those cables are slightly different lengths, you know, it's 18 inches in a second, right? Um, the X300 monitor from Sony, lovely bit of kit, $80,000, um, can't afford it all myself, but it's only got 10 lines of torrent, uh, sorry, 10 pixels of torrents. So if those signals are slightly off, and you know, that, that line rate, that's, that's not a lot. Um, I was having horrible trouble getting poorly. So, it doesn't matter whether it's quad split, whether it's a single frame format, whether it's 20, um, 2082 encapsulated with 2022 by 6, the extension that John Mahatma imagines is working on right now, we can sub it, we can move it across an Ethernet network. 40 gig, like that. that's an $8,000 switch that you can buy on CDW. Um, very cheap, very high bandwidth, that's the equivalent of a 2,000 square router. 2,000 HDs can be pushed through that box. Now it doesn't break out the same way, you probably have to have some other boxes, but in terms of raw throughput and capacity, and it's only 250 nanoseconds from one port to another. Well, that's fast enough. Yeah. So this is where we're looking at that data center economics. And so, a year ago, let's go forward a little bit further. So, um, an HBA um, did the same demo with the 4K, but this time I took a 70 camera cable. You know, those 70 fibers you see on IOB trucks, and probably having the studios on the back of those big brass valley cameras and stuff. Um, what is it? Well, it moves HD video. 
But what it is is single mode fiber. Well, single mode fiber is great. I can have Ethernet in single mode fiber. So what I did here is I took a bi die optic and I ran that over the two fibers and I get 20 gigs of transport across the existing safety camera cable, which you probably already have lying around your studio. All I did was change the optics on that, or change the module on the back end. So breakout cable you can buy um, buy online for about $40. Yeah. <laughs> so, this is off-the-shelf technology that's readily, readily, readily available. And this is the demo that actually was just saying, hey, that can be 4K across a regular safety camera cable we already have. So a year ago, and it, it's hard to imagine this was only a year ago now, because it feels like uh, 10 years ago, because uh, so much has happened in the last year. It's, the industry's gone really into high performance. We did a demonstration where we tried to bring all of this together and show a converged network where we were showing the advantages of having a single wire medium. So we had a camera pack with this one cable coming in the back uh, that was breaking out you know, a linear time code, Genlock, CCU, Tally. There was even ser there was a serial port for doing something else on, the, on that particular camera. It was one of these FRAB engineering ones that has the kind of density. These are on um, the reality TV shows, the whole of the house, and a bunch of crazy teenagers in there film. Um, so we had that, and we had, then had, I had a, a 4K video flow going to the top, and then I had a file transfer going on, and I had them all basically QS against each other. So as you unplug, as you unplug the camera feed, you'd see the file transfer jump up because it was all policied across the network. This was like proof that we could converge things and prove that the technology was ready to do this at the bandwidths and at the speeds and speeds that we need to do and bring all of these things together. Whether you want to do it today, whether you want to do it later, that's up to you. But we proved that you could do it. What was missing from this demo is really how you manage the network. And that was really the focus of um, this year's NAB. So, switching and routing. We all want the IP, for some reason, we all want the IP network to do what the crossbody actually does, which is you press the button and it switches very accurate. So there's lots of ways to do that. We've seen demonstrations, you saw the um, Arist Allower demo, they did what they call source time switching, which is where you kind of manipulate all the SDN tables and do this kind of rather complicated maneuver. Um, last year we did a demo with Snell where we showed what we call destination switching. This is where you tell the endpoint to join the new flow, find the RP168 switch point, and then drop the other flow. Um, the advantage is it's double bandwidth, just for, that, for the frame of overlap. Um, Snell did a really, Snell and Quantel, of course, did a really good uh, white paper where they kind of talked about it and said, that, you know, really the double bandwidth isn't that much of an issue, given for the flexibility that we now have. We're not really managing the network, we're treating the network as a generic resource, and we're just managing our edge devices. So there's two, two different camps here. There's the camp that want to control the network, just like they control the SDI branches. And then there's people who want to try and treat the network as a standalone thing that just you know, look after itself, and we'll just program it from the edge, just like we do today in IT. Um, but the point of this demo was you had a control panel. It looks like a standard random control panel. They had a soft panel and a hard panel. You press the button, within 15 milliseconds, the frame was aligned and switched. So it was within a frame switching time. So they had it compared to an SDI router, and you press the button. Yeah, I pressed it, that was it. In fact, you can't. We did it with a high speed camera and then played back. It's exactly the same. So you don't know what happened behind the scenes, different infrastructure, but same result. The other thing we're showing here is just a mix of codecs. We now because with the IP switch, it can carry lots of different things. We're not bound to just carrying uncompressed. We could carry J2K where we wanted to have some bandwidth efficiency. We could carry, uh, they're using Barrett Pro, which is called EC2. They're also carrying MCI at 200 megabits. So they're showing a lot of different codecs and showing that you can mix and match these codecs across the network, depending on what your requirements were for latency and time. So we've solved transport. We've shot, shot, solved QoS, so we can get it reliably across the network uh, with, with the right time. How about synchronization? Uh, the demonstration we did at um, uh, EBU NTS conference in Geneva, and then we basically replicated it for uh, IBC, was what we call the, uh, like the Network Studio demo. So this was a partnership between BBC, Cisco, uh, Semtech, Stagebox, Trilogy, and um, Tektronics. What we did in this demo is we were really showing off how do I get how do I get sync out of a, out of an IP network, and this was the most exciting people, most exciting thing of the demo it was in a Cisco. Because all of the all of the video engineers went, ah, a back porch. I know what that means. So what we did is you would have this hooked up, you'd unplug one of the IP cables and you'd see the signals just you know slowly drift off as they as they do when two undisciplined clocks are existing. You plug it back in and then within like a uh, like second and a half you'd see it snap in, so you'd have uh, you'd have them you know gen locked together, and you'd also see the linear time code was locked in as well. So we're able to demonstrate time distribution across the network. Using an existing technology, we didn't create anything new. We just took precision time protocol, which is an IEEE standard, which you need hardware assist. We've done a couple of research papers, which we published recently, uh, to show 
why you need to have the right switches and the right, you know, there's a kind of, you can't just go and use unmanaged switch to make this work. You can achieve, and this is fed into the now, now finally published 2059 uh, 2 as of two weeks ago, I think Thursday, it finally was rubber stamped, um, where we have a profile now, and the way precision time protocol works is you have, there's a standard set of commands and messages in the way that it works, but then there's kind of a rule set for how you use the standard, how quickly you send the messages. And really, those parameters are about how fast you want to achieve a certain amount of synchronization. So, for the SEMT profile, we want to achieve microsecond accuracy within five seconds. So I want to be able to plug the camera in to a spigot and have it lock up really, really quickly. If you take another industry like, say, telecom, you know, they use it for cell, uh, cell tower back or you know, synchronization. Cell towers don't generally move around very often. They're pretty much there. So if it takes, takes it 30 minutes to achieve like the high accuracy sync that it needs for the for the time, for the, uh, for the cell tower, it doesn't matter. You know, I wouldn't be able to move a camera around the studio much quicker. Cell towers don't move, the cameras do. So that's kind of the reason why we have a different profile. Now the onus is of course on all the switch vendors to put the safety profile in there. Um, really what it's about is the, the equipment in between really doesn't have to be have any kind of, um, there's a certain level of awareness the devices need, but it's more about the endpoints. The profile is really, we've done some modeling where we've worked out that really as long as we can transit the messages, an awareness of the profile within the devices is not the critical thing, as long as it supports PTP and all of the features, you know, so IPv4, IPv6, multicast, unicast, hybrid modes. Um, the actual profile is more important than the end devices. So we'll see a lot of people talking about devices that will now be safety profile compliant for synchronization. Okay, so three weeks ago, or well, two weeks ago, not sure, three, weeks, three weeks ago, I was, uh, I, and as you can tell from my voice, I actually, um, I did a lot of talking at the show, and I lost my voice after the show, and then I got hit with a really nasty virus. I'm fine now, so don't worry. Um, and so I was actually out for like a whole week. So, <clears throat> so three weeks ago. Um, so the first demo, this is the demo we did, this was really taking the same demo we did last year, but adding this thing, uh, this control app. And what we were really trying to demonstrate was um, how could you actually turn this from just all of this great proof of concept stuff that keeps me amused and keeps me out of trouble. I don't normally wear a suit, by the way. I'm usually in the lab somewhere. Um, you know, hiding in wires and stuff, so this is just to make you think that I'm respectable. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, in this demonstration, what we did was we literally took um, the network as we built previously, and we switched out the devices. We had to use Nexus 7000 rather than ASM 9000s, but that's really immaterial. The, the devices, it, it just matched the speed for what the application. We've done a really robust job of actually going through the product portfolio because you know it's amazing how many different switches and matches system make because we cover so many different businesses. We don't want to just give these lists and say, hey, pick the one that you like. You know? <laughs> we want to really kind of focus in on a few that are really applicable to this business and we focus on the application so that we can say, be much more prescriptive than just say, hey, have a look at the list and tell them you what you like. So in this case we actually use the next seven plans and bring the reasons why we did that. But, um, around you know, its PTP support and other, things, other feature sets that it had and particular line rates and things that we're trying to achieve. Um, but really, the same workflows were existing. So we had two, you know, two cameras, we had a file workflow going through a network, the network was tied together with PTP so we could know exactly the uh, latency through the network. But really what we're trying to show is how we could control the network and manage the network so that we had, A, we're using an off-the-shelf layer 3 network, this isn't a special proprietary network, you know, so I haven't used the word AUV at once in my presentation yet. Um, because we firmly believe in layer three, not layer two. Um, Strict, um, so it's an off-the-shelf layer three network. We didn't do anything special to the switches. There's no special code running in there. There's not like a SEMTI broadcast special you know, image that you need to load on the Nexus that comes with like a SEMTI broadcast license. <laughs> um, it's just an off-the-shelf switch. The whole point about this architecture is if you're going to leverage the data center and leverage the economy of scale, you've got to use the stuff that everyone else is using and the only changes, hopefully, tweaks are just like software layer changes that we're doing something slightly different than controller maybe. And that's what we did in this episode. So layer three based, all standards based, we had the explicit admission uh, control, um, explicit bandwidth reservation through the network, uh, granular priority so we could um, uh, head flows against each other, and we had traffic shaping so we're guaranteeing that we've got nice smooth flows going through the network, we weren't causing microbursts or any kind of horrible things that we all kind of worry about inside data centers. And we had very deterministic latency. We could tell you exactly to the nanosecond how long each package is taking to get through the network. And we could bound that so that you could actually make decisions on the other end about, okay, so I know this flow took 
exactly 10 microseconds to get from this end to this end of the network. So I can use that information to program like buffers or to do some tuning or something else in the head. But really kind of giving you that information, again, off the self box. And the trick to this is actually using a controller, a network controller. So you've heard a lot about SDN. I did a whole thing, I did a whole thing on the broadcast engineering track on a Saturday called 50 Shades of SDN where I went through all of the different things that are going on in SDN and how SDN has just been completely hijacked by marketing folks and just been turned into all these kind of things. You see SDN everything. Um, but really what it is about is about um, uh, Open Daylight is a true SDN controller. It's an open source project. It's one that Cisco actually contributes code to. We might plug into our devices in the hope that people will then use this open source controller and then buy our switches. Um, so what we did in this case is we actually wrote some plugins. We added some special features in those plugins to add uh, bandwidth management. So actually being able to policy bandwidth across the network. How we're actually doing it at the lowest level really didn't matter. I mean, the fact that we had to using access control list and pin trees, that was a detail that you didn't care. All you actually said to the controller was, I would like my flow to get from port, port one to port four take with this bandwidth. And so literally the Northbound API, which is just a really simple REST object, it had four variables. Source, destination, which flow are we going to admit, and what how much bandwidth. So we're really just specifying you know, very simple information into the network. How we turn that into routing plans, that's our problem. We're the, we're the IT experts. We understand how IT switches work. We understand how networks work. That's our problem. We'll figure that out. But really providing this nice clear separation. And this is what was missing last year from the demonstration. This is what was missing in trying to actually productize this and turn this into a real product. So this is a standalone demo where we really dive down and showed you how that stuff worked. What do we actually do? This? Well, we took the same code and we did a whole demo colors have changed quite dramatically here, um, with Grass Valley, where we took, the same, we took that controller, that open daylight controller, we gave them the same code and the same plugins that we wrote for our demo, we compiled that into their convergent control system, which was you know, formerly Pegasus of the Grass Valley plugins. Now, this side of the screen used to be blue, oh, sorry, purple showing Grass Valley, and that side of the screen used to be blue showing Cisco, but obviously the color scheme changed slightly when we import the slides. In, so. But, <laughs> so, this, um, this, all this equipment is on the Grass Valley booth, and all of that equipment was on the Cisco booth. What was tying the two together was a very expensive piece of 10 gig fiber. The uh, LVC in, uh, in Las Vegas will, will run any cable you want, any way you like. But they do have a But then the rate card starts first for the child. <laughs> and goes up from there. <laughs> and I actually had three fibers running because we had another demo where we were doing something to come to Cox, back to New York for a buy 4K feed. And we also had, I was trying to get the GPS in because uh, and I'll explain why I need GPS in a second. GPS, because it's a big lead, kind of an asbestos roof they have in there. <laughs> GPS doesn't seem to penetrate it at all. So. The point of this demo was, this, we were basically a remote production studio. So we had two cameras on our end. We had a multi-view, we had a control panel. On there, and they had the whole booth. They had a the whole ton of stuff connected. They actually had a live. Uh, if you actually saw it, they had, they, had some, they had actors come in, and dancing, and they had a magician. And much more interesting content than just our camera pointing at a bunch of dudes in suits walking around the <laughs> Um, so really what we were able to do is we were able to write signals back and forth between the two booths, we, were about, you know, we could queue up different feeds and we could um, feed them out. We had access to the switches on their end, they had access to us, we could bring up sources. We, everything you want to do is achieve that. Connection between them, the core of the network, is just an IP switch. What they showed is that they could take their control system, they could use our, this, this very simple interface that we built to, you know, called the network controller, which is this SDN product called Open Daylight. And through that, they could just simply send us these very simple commands and say, I need a connection to here, to here, with this much bandwidth, go. And then we were setting up circuits, tearing them down, very, very simply. And through their control system, as far as the operator is concerned, they're just pressing button on the console, they're doing a run down on a server. But they, we were able to bring this together and show a hybrid network. So this is real, this is product that's actually going to be put together. So this has gone from literally two years ago, which is crazy keep with his iPad demo, which is kind of, it wasn't very clean and didn't really work very well. <coughs> We're now in the era where we have products and solutions and cash put together. So I'm sure, hopefully, Grass Valley did the same pitch. They told you all the same stuff we're doing. This is where we're at. This is like next year. I, I fully expect to be talking about all the different deployments we've done. This is literally how far it's gone in just two or three years. So, um, uh, not content with working with Grass Valley, we're also working with Snell. Like I said, we, we don't. We're, we're, our aim is to provide the best infrastructure, and it doesn't matter whose application. Um, in the Snell case, they, they did a, um, a similar demo to what they did last year. They, did, they evolved it a little bit further, but they actually kind of went into our next 9,000 series for energy switches. Um, they actually have some actual projects they're building right now using this architecture. They're going much more for the kind of edge control architecture, whereas Grass Valley is an example of a system that's actually controlling the network in the middle. Snell Contel, after their you know, uh, 
uh, acquisition integration kind of growing pains that they're kind of they're actually at a point where they're actually going back to look at the control model now as well. Again, similar demos we did last year. So last demo, this was a secret coming out of the lab. This was our, our secret technology demo. Um, we talked about source switching, which was the rest of the demo. We talked about destination switching, which was the snail demo. Um, does anyone know Al Kovic? <laughs> Al keep kept harassing us for about nine months saying, you've got to be able to do this in the network, it's easy. I'll tell you exactly when in time to switch from flow A to flow B, and if we get the timing right, you should be able to hit it right in the, you know, the, the line seven, and as far as the endpoint's concerned, it will just switch from one video to the other seamlessly. It's not clean switch, but it's you know, seamless. Yes. Vertical interval switch. So you should be able to do that. Now the problem with um, the way normal routers and switches work is you set, you, if you want to try and update a flow table, you send them a command, it writes it into the flow table and the change occurs. How long that command takes to get through the command or through the CPU down the flow table is not very deterministic. You know, it could take 10 milliseconds, it could take 15 milliseconds. The difference between 10 and 15 milliseconds is, you know, 100 lines of the picture. That's not very, very useful. What you need um, is a way of being able to set an event on the switch to say, at a certain time in the future, can you swap this flow to this flow? Um, the reason we did this now is there's a um, proposed extension to OpenFlow 1.3. I think it's actually going to go to 1.5 now. But it was in the extensions document where they're going to add uh, the ability of a, a nanosecond accurate timer to um, be a variable for how a flow table updates. So I should be able to set a timer for a flow table change to occur. So Al comes back and goes, oh, look at this. He said, if I can do that, then I can do it because I can set the time in the future and it will work. We said, well, you know, we actually have that feature on our, on our ASR router already. It's called multicast only pass through route. It's not a feature for doing flow table updates. It's a feature for redundancy. So this is the good example of a technology that already exists that could be adapted to a problem that we have. So we looked at our multicast only pass through route, which is a way that when one link goes down, I can switch my flow over on a frame on a packet boundary to another link. So I don't on the other end when it converges back, I don't lose any packets. So very yeah, this is trying to answer the, uh, well, Sonic can switch over in less than 50 milliseconds. Well, we can switch over hitlessly. We can do it with no packet loss whatsoever. This is a feature we had where we could do a very high, um, a very precise switch of flight. So we could switch from one packet to another packet more than that. So what we're missing is just a way of triggering that. So what we did is we actually built this, um, we took an off-the-shelf AS9000, and we added a very, very small piece of code, which basically would update this redundancy feature based on a high-resolution timer. Um, again, this was a pure technology demo, because we were trying to answer the question, could you do this? Um, so what you need now is you need to understand where you are in time, and you need to understand where the video is in time. Since we didn't have a device that could actually look at the video frames as well, which in a, in a real solution you would, like the controller would actually be aware of my house clock synchronization. The way we decided to do it was the hard way, which is we took um, um, an SPG, they have a signal generator, which happens to have a PTP Grandmaster in it as well. And Tektronix only has two of these in the universe. Um, the one I, one I got, I only borrowed, I had for like 10 days, and I had to return to them at the show, and the payment there, again, personal child uh, threats. Um, but what it does is, this is why I need your GPS, right? <laughs> so, unfortunately, I didn't get GPS, so it free ran, and I had some problems with it, but we managed to work around that. So what I have now is I was basically getting, getting tri-level sync at one side, and I was getting PTP at the other. Tri-level was locking my video server, so I had two synchronized video players, just like with a normal plan, two, two clocks together. And I was encapsulating those two to IP and feeding them into this ASR. Again, I'm using this redundancy feature inside the box. The ASR has a PTP slave, so it could tie in time, so I was getting frequency and epoch alignment. Now, you can, there's a couple of ways to do this now. The way I did it for the demo is I basically had a script running externally that would kind of query the unit, find out what time it was, and then we calculate back to the epoch, which is January 1st, 1970, and then work out how many frames have occurred since then at the frame rate, and work out what the next frame rate would be by calculating forward. It's 42.8 billion frames at 29.97. I decided it was, that was too hard to do it that way, so I actually moved to an epoch that was like a week ago. Um, so I mean, that was a lot easier to deal with. But the point was, by calculating backwards, I can work out what the next frame rate would be, because my epoch is aligned and my frequency is aligned, so things are going to drift. And what we're able to demonstrate is you could trigger, set this time in the wake up in the future, and do a stream switch from one flow to another. And by the virtue of the way the encapsulator works, and the way um, it does a little bit of error concealment, we could make it hit on line seven, and we could make it so that there was really no disturbance to packet stream, such that you wouldn't see any visual disturbance in the image. And so you could 
using an off-the-shelf switch, no special code apart from kind of slightly tweaking this uh, backup routine, could do clean, you know, um, not clean switching, but uh, seamless switching within, um, within an off-the-shelf device. Do we want to do it this way? Do we really want to try and convert IP devices back to being SDI crosspoints? Probably not. Enough people are asking the question that we had to at least answer it. And there's actually a, there's a SEPTI working group uh, actually looking where we should switch to the network or to if we should. And so we felt this was good. We've actually got some research going on behind the scenes to actually feed data in there. So look look at SEPTI ATG in the fall for um, you know, myself and Thomas Kern standing up saying, hey, this was a great idea, but here's why it doesn't work. Or, hey, this actually does work, and here's the why you maybe want to do it or not do it. So we'll let you know how that research paper turns out. But anyway, so that was, a, that was a, our kind of super secret. Paper. So next steps, where are we? Today, big cross-point ranges in production. We're going to live, we're going to have these things for a while. There are new ones coming that have some IP ports on. Some of them look like IP ranges, but they're actually still cross-point ranges inside. Some of them are truly adding kind of extended IP devices on the end. We're kind of somewhere in the middle there. We really feel that, you know, if you're going to take advantage of the transition, it's either going to be islands of IP with SDI around it, or it's going to be um, IP kind of encroaching in on the core and taking over as it, as it goes. It'll go one way. If you've got a lot of green fields, let me know afterwards. We've got you know, some great deals on ranges right now. Uh, um, but uh, again, a lot of systems have, you know, we can't, we've, got to, we've got to change the engine to other plane, planes flying, so it's going to be a, a transition state. So we firmly believe in this network controller model, uh, you know, basically allowing the, the control system, which understands what it's trying to do, you know, this is the classic, you know, the Snell, the Snell uh, control system, the grass valley conversion, the, uh, the Sony control system. It knows what it wants to get done. It understands all the legacy equipment on the edges. It understands play out servers. It understands graphics systems. It knows how to command and control all these different proprietary interfaces. Have a very simple interface to talk to the network as just another set of resources to so it can control it in the same way it does today. This will change over time. Once you have this new great big network in the middle, you can do a lot more things. Things will change. These are baby steps. These are the kind of stations along the journey that we're going to take. Like I said, the replicating the legacy of our IP today. Network controller really understands the network. It deals with the complexities of, well, that's a Nexus 5000, and that's an ASR 9000. It also deals with third parties. These, these controllers actually deal with other vendors' boxes. I'm not to mention by name, because I've already got shot at the back. We have plugins for all the other That's right. <laughs> we, know, we know that your environments aren't, you know, <coughs> really assisted devices. So even if they are all of the same device, they're probably running different types of code. Well, they've got different line cards in. That's sort all of subtleties and complexities that you really don't want to get kind of bogged down with. The controller knows that, and the controller will tell you, well, I can replicate it here, and here's why, because I haven't found that this line card doesn't need to use the CPU to do that kind of processing, you can do it all the hardware. So these are all complexities that are abstracted away. We know how the network works, we understand our network devices, so this provides us very nice clean separation. So, that's what the end model would look like. The IP network's in the core, the controller abstracts that uh, complexity away. And this is really what we're building right now. This is, we've got to the point where we prove that we prove the transport, the timing standards have come together. Um, there is a lot more to happen in the standards community. We want to make this better. We want to make it so that cameras also discover themselves. They announce themselves to the network and they kind of give up all their capabilities. Also, if, it, if the control system can then push back configuration, oh, you're filming this particular news segment again and the same episode, oh, push the same setting back. Here's all the settings for the iris and the color template, all the things that come. We want to make this network much more, you know, much more functionality. I have a lot more functionality to be able to push presets back and forth. Be able to put a lot more richer metadata if you want the cameras going back up the network. So that, you know, if I'm a geek at home and I really want to know exactly which F stop that camera's set to, I could pull that data out. Why would I want to do that? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there's people in the room that would like to know. But, you know, this information has value. This information is useful for things that you haven't even imagined yet. If you've got this all connected through this kind of network, we've got these things tied together. And that's really what we're doing right now in VSF and the SF is really looking at all of these different things and how we can make it so the camera plugs in just like it does SDR and it works and it's connected to the network. It's synchronized, the video goes to the right place. But much more than that, what can we do beyond that? How can we make this workflow easier? How can we make it, you know, so the operator doesn't have to do these settings after the camera? How do they, you know, the studio then automatically, when a camera gets plugged in, if it's the wrong camera and the wrong port, it alerts you, it says, oh, you need to put that in the wrong place. And it stops it from going anywhere, it doesn't damage the network. So there's a lot more to happen. Anyway, where are we right now? Very open standards base, working with 70 BSF, Joint Task Force, IETM, IEEE. Um, this has to work with the vendor community, uh, the ecosystem. This is not just the Cisco shows. 
well, we want to sell you lots of UCS servers and Nexus switches. This has to be uh, an environment that works with everyone else. It has to all play together, otherwise you don't get the same funding scale. And it has to be off the shelf. No, no more purpose built machines, just all software. With that, thank you very much for letting me talk for way longer than I'm probably supposed to. But thank you very much. Before we open the Before we open this up to questions from the group and also questions on our streaming side, I want to tell you this is probably one of the most informative and um, pleasant, comedically pleasant um, <laughs> presentations that, that we've had. It certainly, if you don't believe this IP technology is going to just sweep into your facility and take it over, then you really don't belong at these meetings because it's so apparent each and every day that this is where we're going. You know, the day of doing dihedral adjustments on a U-matic machine obviously ended a long, long time ago, and we're in a whole different world. So, um, and I know you all know that. That's why you're here. So, any questions for Peter from the group? By the way, thank you so much. Great you're presentation. Thank you. Any questions from the group before we go online? Yes. So, so at uh, at NEB, I think we saw at least three different thought processes of yeah. control, and maybe four. Um, why, why the differences? And some of them were actually from partners that were. Yeah. So, so it, it really depends where people are in the journey or what they're looking at. Some people are really trying to um, to deal with the edge device complexity problem, which is I need to have all of my edge devices talk to my control system. Maybe I can just talk to the network. Maybe I can solve all my problems in the network. So. Maybe I don't have to tell my endpoint to tune to a particular multicast. I can just change it in the network to match what it expects. So there's a very there's a, there's, there's kind of a, a device centric world. And there's a network centric world. So the two really big versions where people are trying to treat the network as an off the shelf network. They're just trying to treat it as an IT network. Control it by using IGMP on the edge to get the flows they need by feeding in commands. Um, there's kind of the ABE world, which is kind of um, being promoted by some other vendors, which is more. The network is, we're still using the network hop by hop, we're using the network, you know, but we're relying on the network to give us a lot of, uh, to do a lot of protection for us, we're relying on the network to be well configured and well managed end to end. So that, that's kind of a hybrid between the two, it's kind of, it's still a hop by hop type mechanism, um, but it's, again, it's more, it's more a device, it's a device centric model, but the network is just, as networks exist today, they're kind of very, networks are great because they're very scalable. You keep adding devices to the network and the branch of records discover the next hot and on the go. That's, that's great for enterprise. Uh, in video, we kind of need to bang our problems a little bit, especially when you get into the core of the production system. So there's the device centric world of trying to treat the network as just a generic network, um, either a kind of an intelligent network, like an ABV network, or just a generic network. Then you have the people who are trying to control the network more at a higher level, so they're just like, like we showed with the SDN control model, where they're just trying to um, establish ranks and paths and really kind of um, control admission and try and solve for some of the, the risks, the you know, security risks and things. And then you have the people who are really just trying to replicate an SDI world by command and control the whole network, really just nail everything down and really feel that part. So you'll see different flavors of those. Is that kind of what you saw? Yeah. So we're, again, we're in this kind of process of, yeah, the state may be very different from where we are now, because again, we're, we're in this kind of, we're, I mean, even 2022-6, right, or this century 2022-6, it's SDI over IP. Is that really the best way to move video across an IP network? With the sync poles and all that blank hank space and all that <laughs> other ancillary data that maybe we don't need, or maybe we'd be better at its own flow, maybe the audio would be better at its own discrete channel. Is there not really a desk without the rabbit video over there as well? Yeah. So, 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 so where do you... Um, you know, just and this is an opinion mm -hmm. question. Uh, where do you see it converging? How long do you see it taking to kind of get a consensus among all of the all of the players? Well, it depends how many vendors are involved, probably. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I, I think um, twenty twenty two dash six will have some legs. I think a lot of people will go there as a way, <coughs> and it will be a way of providing a meet me for a lot of technologies to start with. I think the work, what you've seen, what you'll see in the yes bit stuff coming out of BSF is one of the stated aims at the top is it shall not be transmitted in six, right? We want to have discrete, we want to have single essence types because it means um, it's much easier to approach with network. Also, the way we map uh, content today is not necessarily friendly to software. You know, the way we rasterize video onto SDI was, was useful because that was the way the equipment was used to handling it. We needed to do a certain range of 
you know, randomization, we had you know, things to worry about on the wire. Um, if you want to actually deal with video in a, in a CPU, you want to have it sit in a nice format that can just load straight into memory by doing DMA copies. You want it to come off the wire and drop straight into a buffer, and then I can immediately work on the data without having to do a lot of de deleting and kind of rearranging the memory copies. <coughs> kind of moving, especially pixel by pixel, moves. that's really CPU intensive. <coughs> uh, I mean, it burns a lot of bandwidth just to move some. You've got things like nice byte aligns and they drop into 64 byte registers and stuff. So there's other things, other considerations about taking the video, the raster, and things like that, and making it more friendly to what's going to work on them, which possibly is just software. Other questions from the group? <laughs> yes. There was a couple of companies that were talking about uh, mild compression over <laughs> for the 10 gigabit Ethernet networks. Yep. Can you speak a little bit about that and what the different thoughts are there? Yeah, so I mean the, the trouble with 4K and 60 is it's 12 gig. It's really annoying. <laughs> it's actually 9.8 of active video, so if we get rid of all the ancillary and drop the audio and all that, it does adjust it, but it doesn't help us when we get a high frames. Um, you know, so while 10 gig is ubiquitous and cheap, it's still you know, when you actually look at data centers, 10 gigs still, you know, moving large flows around is still quite difficult. That's one of the reasons it's not that easy to do. I um, mean, we can move data very quickly across the network if it's very small. Managing really big flows very quickly across the network is why it's taken us to now to get to that point. So you've got things like Tico, you've got Barrett Pro, you've got J2K, you've got UCI, all of these different are just basically ways of applying, you know, the, the, the big news this year was really these light, light compression, not the kind of classic ones that we use contribution use, like the Tico, uh, Sony's um, XV, UDS, whatever it's called, um, where it's kind of within a frame. Um, it's like a mild compression, you know, four to one, two to one type territory. Um, they're interesting um, because they help us get more signals through the same bandwidth. Um, it's particularly useful for um, CPU memory buses because while you know getting 10 gig, you know getting 12 gig into a server, it can be done. Getting that across the backplane and getting it usefully processed, it can be done. It's very easy to move a lot of data around the server, but it burns an awful lot of bandwidth. So having that mildly compressed to kind of offload that, and then it's kind of a very small process to un, you know, uncompress it back into memory again, it's compatible with memory models. Um, they're, they're interesting. And what you'll see is I think you'll see a lot more of these kind of SFP, these clever SFPs that can convert in line, where we'll maybe try and move from having that kind of as an onboard process to more of a, we'll plug it into the right device where we need it. You see what MBOX are doing right like now, there's a couple other companies, TCL and so on. They're making these inline modules that do light compression directly onto IP. How does Cisco look at uh of, of making it more of a hardware type of solution like that, rather than saying, let's go to something else that uh, is basically uncompressed and it's just packets. Yeah, we, 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 we really like uncompressed because it means you've got to buy bigger routers. <laughs> <laughs> no selling, Peter, no selling. <laughs> but when I, when I pitched this to the internet, I said, oh yeah, we've got these things that are like 12 gigs, they're going to buy 100. I'm like, wow, it's great. Now, I mean, to be honest, what we're really looking at is that it shouldn't really matter to the network switch. I mean, if it's just a big flow, you know, data center switches are now, you know, well, five years ago this wasn't true, but most, you know, now all data center class switches are fully, you know, non-blocking, wire speed, full cut through, you know, they have the basic features that mean videos are there. People go, oh, I've got this old, like, cat that's 4,000. I'm like, well, you know, that's 10 year ago technology. That's not, it doesn't have the same kind of capability that a, a data center switch does today. So the speeds, I think the speed takes care of itself very easily because we just have a huge roadmap. If you want to do light compression, at the end of the day, if it's software on either end, the codec actually becomes less important. I mean, it really doesn't matter at the end, because um, in general, within the Snell, I mean, within, literally within two days, they wrote a plug-in for the particular codec we used on our gateway. We used RFC 3497, which is an older one that then became Pro MP4, which then got abandoned and said to do the whole, whole new thing. Um, you know, they were able to write, because it's a software decoder for their software multi you know, they were able to write that plug-in literally in a couple of days. And go, okay, here's the RFC, and, 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 it's just software. Um, so what the codec is on either end, if it's complex and needs hardware assist, you'll see these kind of in modules, I think. If it's just software and it's very light, I think it really won't matter. It'll just be a negotiation again. When I plug it in, okay, the speed happens to be uh, 4175 with you know, 3160 audio and a separate UDP port that's two up from it or something. That would just be a file, like a, a main file that gets handed across. So, um, I don't, I'm not too concerned about the codec, 
once we move to software, that problem starts to solve itself much easier than it does today. So we have a lot of dedicated boxes that you have gone by. Like if you want to buy a Cisco compression, uh, you can go by these two. If you want to buy a medium, you can buy these two boxes. It's very bookended today. But that starts to change. So. Um, I do see the value, especially in Tico, and we're actually looking at internally in some of our boxes to move content just around the back plane a lot to be able to get more channels in because we've got more processing than we have I.O. bandwidth. So it's a way of trying to match up the CPU to the, the like an I.O. bottleneck. So. Mike, anybody on the, on the stream side uh, has a question? There was one question, but you, you've answered it. Okay. <laughs> Uh, it is all level three, but you did mention that there is some tweaking required. So when you say there's some tweaking required, is it just management tools for the switch? It's okay. Well, that's the idea. Is you really don't want to change the switch because you want to go to ride the same one. Now, can you buy any switch? Can you go down, you know, um, Best Buy and buy a switch? No, no you, you you were like seven thousand series. I well, guess. you know, we, we're really focused. We've really focused on our data center class because again, because of the you know, non-blocking full cut through, um, because they, you know, and this. There are probably out of that whole range from the 3K up to the 9K, there's probably like five or six switches that we'll probably focus in on the ones that we want to have the complete set of features. But they won't be they won't be specialist features. They'll be standard features, but they'll make sure we have the right TTP profiles available. We we'll won't make sure we've got the right um, line speed, yeah, the right buffer speeds and depths and things so they, they match up to the application. Um, but really they should be the same switch that you buy and somebody else buys. I mean, that's the whole point of the show. Right. And uh, any speciality like bandwidth management for video or video priority, that would be something that's handled in software control. So that's a generic plugin that works across the whole system. It's not specific to the switch. You're not having to buy, okay, you need to buy a Cisco video a Nexus switch. I mean, that's just the same as going and buying, well, let's go buy a big cross point, you know, yeah. like a whole device. There was, there was another question that had yeah. from the back. Couldn't? What is the, uh, for either a television station or just a broadcaster in general? What is the migration path of, like going between an SDI world and an IP world? Well, I think the Gross Valley demo was probably a really good example of that. Is, you, know, you could replace core pieces of the network without, you know, as far as the operator is concerned, you know, the, the consoles and the panels all look the same. It's just parts of the infrastructure behind the scenes that may have been two rectangular routers, one side and one building another, with a bunch of tie lines between them. Now it's become two core routers that have got some, today would have to have some kind of gateway or adaptation on off the two networks. And I guess that's my question is, yeah. The core of all this is a router. I mean, it, are IP video routers out in the public yet? Or in fact, there, are, the, there, there, are, there are some vendors now building um, dedicated kind of IP video routers. So they look like... Why do you do this, though? Well, because I... Mean? <laughs> They're not really IP. Because, maybe I'm, because I'm mixing IP and router, yes. I'm not making IP router. That's why I say router is a cross-point router with IP interface. Okay. As opposed to an IP router, which in the Cisco world is you know, a classic box. You know, so that's why I say router, because router is overloaded between them. It's like, just, like, just like framers. And when I say frame, I mean an Ethernet frame, and <laughs> frame mean picture. You know, so, yes. So, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. So, sorry too. If you work with any uh, storage vendors, maybe being able to store packets directly rather than playing with stream codex on and off. Codex, yeah. Or stream uh, protocols. So I mean we, we obviously on our data center side work very heavily with all the traditional storage companies. We also make our own storage products as well now. That's one of the one of the big moves in um, data center computers is move from kind of dedicated SAN storage systems, these kind of very you know, massive disk arrays with these very complicated controllers to these more kind of direct server attached storage using like an object store model, which is very common in the cloud computer world. And we actually have a product, I won't do a product page on that, a media optimized object store product which is designed to use the data centers, all the different disks and all the servers. But literally the storage is just the simplest, cheapest storage you can attach to the server. There, again, everything's done in software. The way you spread them out, how you do relevancy, how you do data affinity, how you keep objects close to the thing working on them. Well, but what level are you storing the data on? Are you turning it on? Yeah. Today it's been, yeah, today it's generally being converted back to a file, but I know it's an interesting question about whether you can just, you know, I just thought it's just, yeah, it depends what you want to do with it next, if you're just going to restream it again. Right. But you, I mean, in, a, in an IP based plan, that's what you would do, right? And yeah. If you, so you'd have live cameras that are sending you IP packet streams into a router. 
Cisco routers on yeah. the Google so typically we would take the IP encapsulation off to store the content as opposed to storing the original packets. Uh, just because you, when you re, when you bring it back on the network, you've got to readdress anyway. So this is typically the, the encapsulation anyway, at, the, at least up to layer yeah. four. Yes, question over there. So yeah, so you had mentioned earlier in your slide about devices and interoperability amongst other other vendors and mm -hmm. other devices. Uh, can you talk a little about Cisco's thought on discoverability? And so I, there is no trip to be, so there's no actual standard for discoverability. It's kind of an open. No, so uh, at this point, yeah. Well, you guys have an idea on which direction you're going with that, or we have a bunch of discovery protocols already. Yeah, there's a few Cisco proprietary. Now, uh, the general consensus I've seen so far is more like a, an MDN, uh, an MDNS type model. Uh, you know, DNS SD, so DNS discovery, but there's multicast DNS, which is the way of pushing it out generically. Um, there's been some proposals around zero call. You know, the way we make so, you know, we, today you plug it, you know, you don't have to configure your iPhone, you don't have to configure the PC connection network. You just, you know, you have services like Bonjour that discover for Apple devices. <coughs> you can be talking about Bonjour in our working group. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, we only connect to it. No, and that's kind of, that's why I'm asking. We, yeah, exactly. So we, where, where, where I see the groups are right now, and you know, S fits my main lens. I look through also. I'm part of a joint task force. And I'm part of a minimum viable architecture, or minimum uh, minimum viable approach. I think we can group now. Um, is really we try to solve the fundamentals. Discovery is kind of next on the list. <laughs> um, there's a lot of things coming into the hopper. Uh, I, I personally think a DNS SD is probably the right way to go, and then have some kind of you know, exchanges like SMTP format or something. To be, able, you know, to be able to do service discovery on top of that. So. For the benefit of time, uh, yeah, I'm going to kind of, kind of put this into a into a wrap session. Although <laughs> we, we could probably go on forever and ever here. Uh, I had mentioned earlier just to kind of level the playing field, uh, the number of IP products that are out there today. Um, I know we mentioned Grass Valley a number of times and some others, but. Sony, which we are partnered with in a number of different ways, we as an NBC uh, sports group and Gulf Channel with our Olympics and our Olympic commitment and all of that. Uh, Sony has massive uh, IP investment right now, both in their uh, switching systems as well as many other devices, including uh, the real true way to get 4K camera technology back at these major uh, facilities is by far use of IP, and, and that's the important thing. Uh, Grass Valley has a great solution. Sony has a great solution. Um, other companies have great solutions. So I just, as an engineering standpoint, look at everything. Um, there are not many players in the market like Cisco. However, and I use the word not many, not that there aren't any players in the market like Cisco that have uh, a lot of these technologies and solutions on the table. That being the case, we've played here at Gulf Channel with uh, the IP55 solution, uh, which is Sony's solution, we've taken back multi-cameras from a golf course here, and, and Bob Van Deering was uh, kind of a, a leader himself and Robert Majors in getting this back here and into us, which are in the same time sequence and obviously all locked. It looked great. We we're looking at experimenting with the IP Live, which is a truck version. I did see uh, Turing Video's IP truck in Vegas, which is totally IP. I did see Game Creek's truck in Vegas, which is totally IP. So there are two emerging things in the forefront, and that is 4K movement is IP. No other way to go. We can't be taking, you know, triax this big with copper conductor that's two inches in diameter to, you know, to run it out a half a mile in order to get a signal back from a camera. So IP is the solution. So um, again, it's here. It's not coming. It's here today. And all the technology that will be built going forward is going to be using this. Why wouldn't you have a Cat5 or a Cat7 cable running all this technology instead of a huge piece of cable that weighs hundreds and hundreds of pounds in transport just to get it around in mobile, plus you know, all the other solutions are present. So one of the best presenters that we've had, one of the best presentations. And again, I applaud you and thank you so much. planning on, but it has been requested by a few people tonight, so this is such a great facility. Uh, Brian Scudar has offered to give a tour to people who would like to, uh, not a long tour, but a short tour. If you'd like to see the facility, Brian is going to take some people and show you this uh, great
great facility where you can find all the aspects of production. Really. So Brian is the gentleman here with the all channel. Very The one wearing the red clown nose that we've all been, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're the one that said that. I figured Android device, I saw you. Exactly. Yeah, it's like Thank you very much,